Tell us a little bit more regarding your background and your present focus. Sure. I started uh, almost 40 years ago as a, a lawyer in San Francisco. I had the good fortune to uh, get a job with an excellent law firm. When I first started out, Diogo, I wanted to be like so many uh, people. I wanted to be a, a child lawyer, you know, like the, the kind of lawyer you see on TV, going to court and winning cases. And I did that for, oh, I don't know, five hours before I found out that it was boring and it wasn't fun and it was actually, it was really soul killing. And fortunately for me, my firm was large enough that it had a good real estate practice. And so I, after maybe six months, I went to the managing partner of the firm and, and pleaded with him and said, please let me be a business lawyer. I, I can't stand going to court. I can't stand all of these motions and paperwork. And he said, no, <laughs> but after another six months, somebody quit and there was an opening in the real estate department. And I think I was 25 years old. And so I switched and suddenly I was helping people buy and sell shopping centers and hotels and office buildings, uh, doing the paperwork. I was drafting leases. I was doing purchase contracts and that was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed that. I liked being positive. I, I liked the whole um, uh, kind of forward uh, progress part of it and actually making something. I love seeing buildings get built. Anyway, I was probably, oh, I don't know, 27, 26, 27, and I was making $15,000 a year, which was not a lot of money. <laughs> it, it's not much now. It, it, it wasn't much then. Anyway, in comes on a Friday, a wintry day on a Friday, this is in San Francisco. In comes a couple of young guys who were about 32, and they were selling a building in Denver, Colorado, a small office building, uh, to my client, which was the Bank of America. And I was always pretty good at basic arithmetic. You know, I, I could do math, uh, I could do multiplication, addition. So while I'm taking notes about the purchase contract, I'm figuring out that these guys who are not that much older than I am are gonna make a million dollars. And remember, I'm making $15,000 a year. So I said, whoa, I gotta to get to the other side of this. I gotta stop being a lawyer and I've gotta become a developer. <laughs> so that was my epiphany. And it what really frosted it, if this was a Friday afternoon, it was a wintry day, and here in California, we have some great skiing, which is about a four hour drive away up at Lake Tahoe. Uh, and so when we finished about one o'clock with all the negotiating of the contract, these young guys said to me, John, you work over the weekend and uh, get these contracts done. We'll we're gonna go skiing for the weekend at Lake Tahoe and we'll come back and sign the contracts Monday morning. And I said, you know, son of a bitch, I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> or I'm in the, the wrong, I'm in the right business, but the wrong aspect of it. So that kind of kicked it off. And actually, by then, I was already buying little properties on the side. Uh, my hobby, it, you know, my hobby wasn't bowling or archery. My hobby was making money. So I was buying a house here, fixing it up and selling it, buying a duplex there, fixing it up. About that time, I bought a, um, a four unit building in San Francisco that was an apartment building that uh, with three friends, I converted into a condominiums and just the conversion from the apartments to condominiums that helped us. Uh, you know, we made it would seem like a small fortune at the time and that kind of started. And gradually uh, I teamed up with an older partner, an older client. So I was 26, 27, he was maybe 15 years older, very competent uh, retail developer. Uh, and he, he was an excellent developer, but he wasn't very good at selling and, and at selling himself, selling projects. And I think you probably know that if you cannot sell yourself as a developer, if you cannot tell the farmer from whom you wish to purchase the land or the old lady from whom you wish to purchase the building that you want to tear down. If you can't convince her that you're the right guy for it, that you're honest and that you're competent, 
you're not going to get anywhere. Uh, and so with this older partner, he, I mean, he was excellent at, at laying out where the truck dock should go, how the parking should lay out, where the building should go, but he just wasn't much of a salesman. So I became not only his lawyer, uh, but also because I could sell a little bit, I also became his spokesman. And then we became partners. We built our first shopping center in the wine country uh, in a small town called Healdsburg in 1983. And it turned out to be, <laughs> with lots of heartache and, and obstacles along the way, it turned out to be a great success. And we still own that center. Uh, and that was the foundation. That's how I got into the retail shopping business, shopping center development business. And I've been, so that's 35 years ago, more or less, and I've been doing it ever since. There's one thing that always, always strikes me and usually puzzles me, to be honest, is how, how confident are you when you make all the work, all the projects, all the developments, and then people don't show up? This is something that is always in the back of my mind. So is this something that is, do you think there's no issue here? Or do you think this is actually a real issue when you're actually doing a development project, but then you can't sell it in the end? Now, when you say people don't show up, you mean the tenants don't show up? No, what I mean is because I have seen projects that were done. So essentially they took all the time to do all the work and completed a project, but then they couldn't sell it. So you end up with like this phantom building with no one essentially. So it's kind of this horrible vision to look at. I see your point. In retail, in, in my world, in shopping centers, you know, I work with the biggest tenants in America. I work with Safeway, I work with Walmart, I work with Ross. Uh, and what we will typically do, and we've been doing this for a while, so we know what good locations are. And we also have these long-term relationships with these tenants. So Walmart, for example, will say, John, we'd like to go into this small town. Uh, we'd like to go into Modesto. And, you know, why don't you work with us? And so then I'll go over to Modesto. The town is about an hour and a half away from here. And I'll drive around and I'll find what I think is the right intersection. And they'll say, yes, you can keep simplifying things. That, that's a good deal. Uh, we like that location. So we typically, we will have our main tenants lined up. What we have going for us there is they have very sophisticated and large scale market research. So they know that it, uh, this town has a, uh, they call it an addressable market, a total addressable market. It, it has this many consumers, uh, this many shoppers, uh, this uh, much in total dollars. And they'll say, yeah, we'll do great here. And so we can piggyback, if you will, or, or ride on their coattails on their research. Uh, so when we know that if we build a shopping center with Walmart, for example, or with Safeway, there's no problem. People will show up. And because these are great credits, uh, there's no problem in selling them either. Does that make sense? Yeah, sure. Because I, like I said, I've seen in really large uh, shopping malls here that it's a phantom town, essentially, because they built it. People sort of went there, but then a new shopping mall was developed some years uh, after along the line, and everyone started going to the other place. So what, when it, what ended up happening is essentially it's a bank-owned bank property, and essentially it's kind of a, a phantom shopping mall. This is the reason that I asked you okay. this. Good questions. That's, I'm in uh, what they call necessity retail, and, and that's... In English, there's a great ring to that, necessity retail. So we typically build supermarket anchored centers. Uh, uh, and they're not that large. Uh, it's, they're, let's say, 10,000 square meters uh, and on roughly 10 acres. And typically, they'll have a supermarket, which is half of that size, uh, four to 5,000 square meters. Uh, and again, they've done their market research. And we don't... And then the, uh, the smaller tenants that we have, a bank, a nail salon, pizza, um, now we're getting, because of the internet, we're moving more into services. So uh, on my desk is a, uh, an offer from a, um, a medical group, you know, urgent care, which is sort of halfway between going to the doctor and going to the emergency room, or dentist, 
uh, or beauty salons. So we, d and, and there's, there's smaller properties and, and we know what we're doing. Uh, what you've described happens all over America. Uh, what usually happens is uh, in areas where zoning is easy, where it's easy to obtain permits, one, and two, uh, where, the, where money is easy, where there's a lot of money out there, and three, where you have fellows who have uh, more ambition than experience. So if, if they can get the zoning easily, if they can get the money easily, uh, and if, if they can dilute themselves, if, if they can say, well, uh, Diogo has a center a half a mile away that's full, we'll build the same thing. Well, again, there's, there's only a certain number of uh, shopping dollars available in any town. And so that happens a lot. It happens a lot. Uh, the poster child for that here would be in Texas because there's no zoning there, uh, particularly in Houston, Texas. And so if I build the best shopping center in the world, you can tomorrow build one a little bit bigger, a little bit prettier, and you could gold plate the whole thing across the street. I can't prevent you. So one of the things we like to do uh, is build in areas where it's extremely hard to get permits. One, in San Francisco, uh, my hometown here, Palo Alto, the home of Stanford University, where, where the local authorities hate development. That, that's the best place to go. Because <laughs> you know, if, if I build my shopping center, and you know, it takes me 10 years to get the approvals, well then I know that Diogo is not gonna be able to come back in and compete. Sure, sure. So uh, one of our main highways here in California is Highway 1, because it runs along the coast, and then Highway 101. We, and then inside in the Great Central Valley, there's Highway 5. So what we will typically do, and it's very easy to develop in the Central Valley, where the, the towns are smaller, the, the towns need development, you know, and so they're very encouraging and you get the situation that you described where it's very easy to get overbuilt. So if we build something out there, we sell it the day it's, it's open. We just put it on the market and, we, and what we keep in our portfolio, like that center I described in Healdsburg in the wine country, which sits right on top of Highway 101, we keep those because we know that, that it's highly competition constrained. Right, because the only issue, essentially, the only issue that I that I'm interested in addressing is when the the developer gets delusional. So essentially, is essentially fancying himself when he's doing the development, saying, "I like this type of countertops, I like this type of windows, I like this type of materials," but then in the end, it's not what the client, so the the actual paying person wants. So this is what, what I wanted to address because you are, have such a tremendous experience is understanding your path into kind of uh, striking a balance between what you like, but then serving what actually paying people are, uh, want. Well, it's a little different here. I'm not sure how the system works in Portugal, but here, uh, we, those two people that you described, that's one person. We use our own money. Uh, we don't have, you know, I'm, I'm very fortunate. We're a small company. We build a couple projects a year, but we make the decisions uh, and we only use our own capital. We don't have outside financial partners. It took us a long time to get there. You know, everybody likes my position today, but they wouldn't have liked it, you know, 40 years ago when I was, you know, 15,000 a year. So we don't have that uh, tension or dichotomy, if you will, between, uh, the developer and, and the money partner. And we're not in the business of building um, monuments to ourselves. You know, we're, we're not gonna build a glass tower because it's beautiful and I wanna put my name on it. We're, we're professionals. We're in the business of making money. Uh, if you wanna give money to a city, you donate it to them. You, know, you write them a check. Uh, but, so we build kind of bread and butter shopping centers. Um, and, or, you know, we renovate shopping centers. So we'll take an old center and fix it up. But it always has to be. Well, one of my friends said years ago that he would never go look at a property if he was interested in buying it, Diogo, until he fell in love with the numbers. He wants to see the numbers on paper to make sure that, the, let's say, the, that the return you want is 10%. He's got to see that first before he goes out and sees the, the ocean view 
or the old timbers or, or any of the sexy part of the building, forget that. The deal has to make sense. And, and that is good advice and that, that's how we do it. But again, we don't have that issue of, of trying to please a, a financial partner. And, and, that, and that makes sense because you tend to kind of fudge the numbers a bit to get to your way. So if you have this kind of disconnect in the beginning, I think it helps you in the long run. Right. Uh, developers are like everybody else. They lie to themselves about everything. And they, they lie to themselves about how handsome they are or about how smart their kids are. Sure. Uh, and, that, and that's okay. But you, if you lie to yourself about numbers, if, if, as you say, if you fudge the numbers, that's a good way to go broke. Uh, you really have to have strong discipline. You really have to say, you, you know, what you'll see a lot is you'll see, uh, well, Diogo has a, an office building here across the street. He's getting $2 a foot in rent or, or a month. So let's say he's getting $24 a foot annual rent. But our building is going to be much nicer than his. We're going to have a beautiful atrium with uh, a waterfall. So we'll get $2.50 a foot. Well, wait a second. That's not right. The market is $2 a foot. But the people will um, goose up or, or raise their numbers in order to, to hit these uh, uh, thresholds. And I see that all the time. Or you'll see somebody say, buy this property. And here, are the, for the next 10 years, here are the expenses. They're absolutely flat. And here's the income that goes up like this. Well, that's not the real world. You know, if you're lucky, if you're lucky, the expenses and the income are on the same trajectory. Uh, anyway, so don't lie to yourself about numbers. That you, you've got to have that kind of discipline. Sure. One, one other topic that I wanted to address is regarding, and this is a touchy issue, but it's, I think it's important to address, is regarding teams and contractors. Because I, I know you have to kiss a lot of toads until you get the prints, like the story says. So in, in this issue, I'd like to hear your thoughts on getting the prints <laughs> as, a, as a contractor, so, so, to, so to speak. Great question. Um, what we do, uh, we... You know, we're a small company. I may be worth, I, I've had two partners, uh, Beth Walter and Mike Powers, and I've had them for the whole 35 years. Uh, and we have maybe a total of 10 people in the company. But what we've done, Diogo, is we have worked with the same contractors uh, for almost that whole time. The, to the, the two contractors that build most of our properties are very well regarded, and they're almost on the team. You know, it, they're outside independent contractors, but they do project after project for us. So I don't have to um, read the contract the second, third, fourth time. It's here's a new deal. It's five million dollars, and, and here's the new address. So you're basically just changing the um, the plans, the address, and the numbers. And, and, and it, basically, what I'm saying is, if you find somebody that is good, if you find that after kissing a hundred toes you stick with that prince uh, and we have done that uh, so we worked with the same two contractors primarily for, for 92 so 25 years uh, and, and and that enables you also to be much more efficient if you don't have to hire a lawyer to go through a contract every time if you go out to bid every time uh, you know you're you have a lot more paperwork, a lot more, um, a lot more smoke and, and less heat. <laughs> you know, if, if I can just say, okay, we're, we're going to buy this. And, and then while I'm in escrow, before I go non-refundable, I call my contractor and I say, you know, we want to tear these three buildings down. We want to keep this one and we want to add uh, 5,000 square meters of, of new building. Give me a price on that. So then I'll know that. And it, maybe we pay a little bit more, but I think it's a, an effective insurance policy, especially for a small company. It enables us to act like a, a much larger company. Because if you think about it, a large development company is the same as ours, except it has a contractor in-house, it has an architect in-house, it has engineers in-house, it has leasing agents in-house. And that's all well and good, except you've got this enormous overhead. If you've got a, 
I'll make up a number. If you have a $10 million a month overhead, you need to run really hard. <laughs> and you've got to do lots and lots of deals to pay that overhead. Because we're a small company and we have these very strong outside relationships, uh, we have, our overhead is, is very contained. So we don't have to do deals, which again enables us the luxury of not lying about numbers. You know, we, we, uh, we can say, no, this deal makes sense or it doesn't, but we don't have to do deals. So we do them if, if they're, if we at least believe they're gonna be profitable and, and fun. Now, are they always profitable? No. Have I lost money in deals? Of course, everybody does. But uh, for the most part, you know, we do pretty well. And regarding regarding your portfolio, because there's there's a time to to sell the, the portfolio. Do, I would like to hear your thoughts regarding when when do you think it's a time to sell some 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 of the assets that you hold. That is an excellent question. And, and by the way, um, I have given a series of, of talks for the Urban Land Institute. They're posted on um, YouTube. And one of the talks, that it's a 45-minute talk on this very topic, the sell versus hold. And I think that's the hardest decision in, uh, in real estate, for sure. Going back to what I've already told you, I'm just kind of piecing together a couple of the threads. One, we use our own money. So the only way we can use our own money from the beginning, the only way you can do that is you have to sell. If I had a financial partner from day one uh, who would give me all the money I wanted, but uh, he said, I never want to sell, then I'd never have any of my own money. I'd never be able to start my own company. So we have developed in the last 35 years, maybe 80 plus projects. So a little more than two a year. Uh, our portfolio today is close to something like 25 to 30 projects. So we've basically sold two out of three, just to give you the, the big picture. And back to what I said before, when we sell, if it is a, a location where anybody can come in and build another building next to ours, in, in other words, there are no barriers to entry, where um, it's almost like, you know, we have this battleship and we pull it into the bay. And if we just sit there and park it, we know someone's going to you know, blow us out of the water. We sell that immediately. We'll put it on the market as soon as the major lease is signed or, you know, when they're cutting the the ribbon at the grand opening, it will sell it. Uh, the things we keep, again, are in the areas that are highly competition constrained, where we love the tenant, we love the town. Here in Palo Alto, it's very difficult to develop. Uh, Stanford University is here, but the town is, uh, I wouldn't even say indifferent to development. They're almost actively hostile to it, but there's such job creation here because of all the, you know, the brilliant people at that Stanford that it, it's a great place to own real estate. So we do sell, and it typically, I would say most properties, uh, they look their best on, on the grand opening day. When, they, when they're brand new, they're fully leased, and the leases have 10 years to run, that's a great day to sell the properties. What you don't want to do is seven years out, say, oops, you know, uh, it, uh, I need to sell. The other thing is you want to sell when you don't have to. <laughs> you, uh, you, you want to sell when it's an option. If, if you get a divorce uh, or a disaster or your partner wants out, if you're forced to sell, that's when you're going to make a bad sale. So if you can kind of stay ahead of that. Um, but uh, And I, I think it's a another talk I just gave that was just posted. I think one of the, the traps that most people in real estate, young guys like, like yourself, if they're good at real estate, they tend to have all of their assets in, in real estate. Uh, they don't have anything in the stock market. They don't have anything in uh, any other asset class. So one of the beauties about selling is that you can uh, diversify a little bit. So uh, now, I think I was 50 years old before I had any liquidity, before I had anything other than my equity in, in these various shopping centers and properties. But I think it's a good idea, and another reason to sell, you sell, you pay your taxes, you put some money in the bank. And, and the banks actually love cash, and they're highly skeptical for good reasons of when you say, gee, I've got this cool office building, and I have a 10% interest in it, 
and my equity or my share is worth a million dollars. The banks go, oh yeah, sure. <laughs> you know, they, they, they've they just seen that too much. Okay. Okay, oh, what, what I wanna actually take, picking up on that topic is regarding staying focused. And what I wanted to understand is, if you are looking at the market and seeing that it's getting cap rates are getting a little bit compressed, so everything is on the pricey side, do you still stick with trying to get deals or you kind of, let's say, jump to triple nets or some other type of angle in order to keep deal flow coming? Excellent question. We have gone a year, even two years without buying anything. Um, one of the reasons we're still in business is that you know, we're cautious. So if we think things are too expensive, we'll just sit on our hands. We'll just look and say, no, that doesn't make any sense to us. Uh, and that happens with regularity. We've had a, a bull market here for almost nine years now, and it's been hard to find properties that, that make sense to us. What we won't do is buy a, some finished property that has a five or 6% return. Uh, you know, that doesn't, again, that's a battleship waiting to be blown up. Um, we will just say, no, this doesn't make sense. Uh, we, again, we're, we're in a fortunate position of not having to buy. We don't have a big overhead. We don't have a financial partner insisting that we put money out and it's just our own capital. Um, and I, I think at the, the market is pretty well peaked here in office and residential. Uh, I have no, no idea about Portugal, but when it, it peaks out like that, you, you have to say, now's the time to sit. And historically, we have done better in down markets. You know, once it really collapses, then because we've got our capital, uh, and then we can go in and we might buy four or five properties in one year. Yeah. And so it, it'll average out over the last 35 years, a couple of years, but we'll buy a lot if, if we can, you know, when there are some, some bargains to be had. But, but you don't jump ship to a different asset class within real estate just to keep the, just to keep the deal flow no. pipeline com coming, keep it coming That's in? That's another good question. Our expertise, uh, particularly for a small company, I think this is uh, important. Uh, we are highly focused in two ways. Geographically, all of our properties are within a two-hour drive of San Francisco high geographic focus and we're also focused in retail and then within retail you know back to your earlier comment you were talking about the problems essentially of large malls uh, in, that are 300 so what is that uh, about 100,000 square meter malls or, or whatever we just do neighbor what, what we call here neighborhood shopping centers that are supermarket anchored and, and they tend to be between uh, uh, five and, and 10,000 square meters, uh, you know, five to 10 acres. So we are highly focused on a product type. That's what we've developed. In fact, we're about to build another one in the spring. Now, that said, so, and, and retail has been very challenging, you know, across the globe because of the internet. And, and frankly, in, in the US, we just have just like you described, we have too many retail buildings. We just have this vast oversupply. So retail is difficult. I have uh, friends and competitors who have left and, and gone. One went to self-storage. People will move to apartments. We have not done that. But what we have done, back to this idea that diversity is your friend, we've taken profits from the sale of shopping centers uh, so we have these suburban shopping centers, which is one kind of risk. And we bought small office buildings uh, in urban settings here in Palo Alto. So we have one asset class that we develop and another asset class that we have invested in as a way to diversify our real estate portfolio. Gotcha. And on, still, still on this topic, I'd like to know regarding getting too big. You talked about this in, in one of your, in your ULI conversations about uh, companies that they become too big and then they essentially, they implode on themselves. I'd like to hear your thoughts on this. Um, I'm not quite sure. 
Essentially, because we're taking projects, they eventually larger projects and larger projects, and event eventually it's the oh, project gets too yes, large, yes, and then they get yes, over cocky. No, okay, yeah, I, I see. Yes, yeah, I, we made that mistake. Um, you know what happens? Uh, that that's another uh, interesting point. You know, when, when you start out, when you're 24 years old, and, and you buy a duplex, and, and you make money with that. Uh, and then you take that money and you buy a fourplex. And this is exactly what I did. And, and you, you do well with that. And then you, you take that money and you buy a, a 16 unit property, 16 unit apartment project, and you do well with that. And then I think we moved to an industrial property that we paid a couple million dollars for. And so we went from like $25,000 on our first purchase in the, in the space of maybe five years up to, this is in the 1980s, about close to $20 million. So each project was getting larger and larger and larger. The problem with that, uh, it's exactly like going to a casino and playing 21 and winning the first hand and leaving the, the money on the table, winning the second hand, leaving the money on the table. Sooner or later, it doesn't matter if, if, uh, you're, you're <laughs> If you're Albert Einstein's son or you're Warren Buffett, sooner or later you will lose money. And so if you take all of your, your profit and just double down and just keep it, go from you know, 5, 10, 15, 20 million dollars, and so each project is larger, you will go broke. And it, it, it might, might be the 10th project, but sooner or later you'll lose money on it. So my point, again, back to financial discipline, development discipline is to work yourself up to a level, and frankly, ours is five to $20 million, but to work yourself up to a level and, and kind of stay at that level, uh, you know, maybe you can grow a little bit. So if let's just say, I would say that a, a successful developer makes money, uh, makes a lot of money, maybe once or twice out of 10 deals, makes a reasonable amount of money, maybe five times, so that's seven, Maybe they break even one or two times, but maybe that 10th time, you know, one out of 10, you're gonna lose money. So if you're doing it, uh, if you're making a million dollar profit, just to keep it simple on, on nine deals, on the 10th deal, you lose your money and you lose the million of, you, know, you not only make no money, but you lose a million, well, you're okay. But had you done that stair step to heaven, you know, the, the casino approach, you'd be broke, you'd lose everything. And you see that a lot, the guys with the big egos, like the fellows who build the high rises in New York City or, or London, they'll keep going up and up and up and up until they explode. In real estate, usually it's re pretty local, it's a local game. And I, I'd like to hear your thoughts if uh, investing overseas, investing with partners that like um, on a country completely outside of US, would this be something that would interest you or are you still always looking at your backyard essentially? Yeah, no, it would have no interest, <laughs> zero interest to me. I, I, I would love to come to Portugal, I understand it's, it's a beautiful country. Everyone says it's a lot like California, but only as a tourist. I think uh, you're absolutely right. The real estate is an extremely local business. Now, I do know fellows who have made fortunes investing overseas, uh, everywhere from Brazil to Southeast Asia, but that's that's above my pay grade. That's not something I'm interested in doing. Uh, I like staying local. Now, if back to the point, if if somehow I met the absolute right guy and. Uh, you know, I wouldn't do it, but I, I guess I'd be tempted. And he says, well, here, you know, we can get a 30% return. But it gets more complicated because if you're investing overseas, then you have currency risk as well as the, the real estate risk. So I can double my money in Portugal, but then suddenly have, you know, the, the, the dollar strengthen or, or fail and, and I'm out again. So I, I personally wouldn't have interest in that. I'm not that ambitious. Sure. And I'll also like to take this topic regarding younger entrepreneurs and what would be some of your advice when people essentially they, they want to do their transition. When, and we talked about this in our uh, first phone call and starting to get in real estate because when they eventually starting to getting in, probably they, 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 
they are faced with this huge hurdle regarding not having enough track record or some, some other impediment. So I'd like to hear some of your strategies in order for them to connect with local or more experienced developers in order to get them started in the game. To get, how to get started in the game? Yeah. Yeah, the, the, I think the only way to get started is to start, and the way to start is to, is to start small and to start with uh, your friends and family. Uh, you're not going to convince a developer. Um, now, the, the tricky part is finding a property uh, when you don't have any money, right? And, and you don't have any credibility. So what I tell the, the young guys who come to my office when they ask me about this, I say, here's what you do. You decide what kind of property you want to buy, whether it's industrial, retail, residential. You decide where you want to buy it, and you decide the price range. So if you want to buy, um, let's say, apartment projects in a given uh, town in the $500,000 price range. Uh, so you decide, you focus on that, and then meanwhile, you go to uh, your friends, your family, and you say, look, this is what I want to do. I'm not asking for commitment, but if I find just the right project where we can all double our money in two years, would you, Diego, have interest? Uh, and if so, how much would that interest be? And you say, sure, I want to be a player. I'm in for 50000 And so I, as uh, the would-be developer, I have 50000 from from Sam and from Tom and from John. And so I 50,000 kind of loosely committed. So then I go to the broker uh, and say, okay, I've got the money. You know, it's a balancing act. I, I say, you know, I want to buy a half a million dollar project. And I need 200,000 in equity. And I've got 50,000 from four of my friends or from my mother or, or my grandmother or something like that. And frankly, my mother helped me out um, in my first couple projects. She, she loaned me couple thousand dollars so there's nothing wrong with that you know that's what families are for but on the other hand you can't lose their money otherwise you can't show up at christmas <laughs> anyway does that make sense uh, it, I, I would i would say start small and then if, if you're meant to be a developer you'll succeed it and then the, if if you double everybody's money the first time it's much easier to raise money the second and the third and what you'll gradually do is you'll grow out of, you know, unless you're a, a Rockefeller, uh, you'll grow out of friends and family. You'll, you'll run out of, of money. And then, but at that point, you know, you'll have enough of a track record that you can be introduced to others and you know, gradually work your way up to um, institutional capital. Sure. And, and that's makes pretty much the way it's done. And taking this uh, on a different topic, because I'm a bookworm and <laughs> my subscribers share the same, <laughs> the, the, same, the same passion. So I'd like to hear some of your thoughts regarding some of your all-time favorite books. And my all-time favorite books are novels. Uh, I, I don't read business books. I guess I wrote one, but uh, <laughs> uh, my all-time favorite books are Middle March by George Eliot. Uh, War and Peace, of course, by Tolstoy. Uh, for a story, uh, Pride and Prejudice, Jane Austen. Uh, the Patrick O'Brien, who passed away recently, had a, a, the Irish writer. He he wrote, uh, I think, 21, 22 uh, books in a series called the Aubrey Matterin series about the um, the British Navy during the Napoleonic Wars. Uh, Cormac McCarthy, who's an American writer, who uh, he's famous. A lot of his, his books have become uh, the movies, All the Pretty Horses, um, The Road. Let's see, what's another? Um, no Country for Old Men. Those are some. But I, I find you, you learn a lot more about life reading, non reading great novels. You, you know, there are better insights. And then, then how to books, uh, you know, or, or get rich books and stuff like that. Sure. I, I read all the time, but it, they're almost always novels. 
John, advice to your younger self, what would you say? Uh, buy Apple stock. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously. <laughs> well, that's serious. Uh, what would I say? Uh, say that's a tough one I, I, I think things have turned out pretty well so so I, I can't uh, it would be impious of me to, to ask for uh, to, to tell myself to, to get I, I've been so lucky just absolutely so fortunate in my career that I, I don't think I, I would give myself any different career advice that that, that, that would not you know that would be um, tempting the gods, I guess. <laughs> so I, I would think I'll pass on that one. <laughs> sure, there's, there's no right or wrong answer here. So, and, and, and if people want to get a hold of you, where can they, where, where they, can, they, can they go to? Well, they, they can, uh, they can uh, link in on LinkedIn. I'm on LinkedIn. They can send me an email at johnmcnellis.com. I'd suggest uh, the book that I wrote, which, um, you know how to making it as making it in real estate. How to start out as a developer. It's a very if people who who like it uh, love it because it's short and it, it's not really a how to book. It, it's more of principles. It's more strategic than tactics. Um, I would suggest that they, they get a copy of it. I think it's ten dollars on Amazon. Uh, read that. They can look at. I write a monthly um, business article for a commercial real estate magazine called The Registry. They can look at those, you know, where I, I, I comment on uh, real estate companies. We work, Airbnb. I just wrote one on a mattress firm, which is a big company that's imploded here. So, uh, and then the talks that I've given that are on YouTube, I think there are five or six of them posted and they, they get watched with something like that. Okay. Okay, Johnny, it was wonderful having you with us today. We'll speak uh, soon. My pleasure.